Welcome to the deep dive, your shortcut to being truly well-informed. We cut through the noise to bring you the most impactful insights. Today, we're diving deep into a topic that is, well, absolutely fundamental for anyone in acute care, acute pancreatitis. Our mission here is to pull out the essential nuggets you need for diagnosing, understanding, and managing this often tricky condition. We're leaning heavily on insights from Dr. G.S. Raji's fantastic YouTube series, really clear, practical stuff. And like, this isn't just theory. If you're a med student on the wards, a resident juggling calls, or a GI fellow honing your skills, this is packed with high yield info you can use right away. ER, wards, clinic, you name it. Absolutely. And that practicality is why this deep dive is so crucial. Acute pancreatitis is common. It can get severe fast, and um, sometimes it's missed or misdiagnosed initially. Getting the assessment, diagnosis, and management right and doing it quickly can genuinely change patient outcomes. Yeah. So we want to give you a kind of systematic framework for approaching these patients. Okay. Let's, uh, let's unpack this with a classic presentation. Picture this. A 60-year-old woman comes into the ER severe constant epigastric pain like an eight or nine out of ten radiating straight to her back been going on for hours and she's been vomiting repeatedly when you hear that what's the first thing that should pop into your head and crucially what else must you rule out right that clinical picture screams acute pancreatitis yeah it really does but you're spot on before you lock onto that you absolutely have to run through the differential for epigastric pain other things can look very similar. For instance, peptic ulcer pain usually comes and goes, often tied to meals, not usually this constant severe pain. Acute cholecystitis, typically a more right upper quadrant pain, maybe radiating to the right shoulder. Some vomiting, sure, but maybe not quite like this presentation. And with an older patient, say 60s, 70s, you always have to think myocardial infarction, especially an inferior MI. Don't forget that. Also, perforated gut. Usually that pain is sudden, like a thunderclap, whereas pancreatitis pain builds up over minutes to hours. So you need that differential first. Okay. So you've run through those differentials. Pancreatitis is still top of the list. What are the hard criteria? How do you definitively make the call? It's pretty strict, actually. Dr. Raju really hammers this home. You need at least two out of these three specific findings. One... That characteristic clinical presentation we just talked about, the severe epigastric pain radiating to the back, hours long with the vomiting. Two, biochemical evidence. And this is key elevated serum amylase and lipase. But not just elevated, they have to be more than three times the upper limit of normal. Ah, so just a little bump isn't enough. Exactly. Mild elevations like one or two times the limit. Not sufficient for the diagnosis on their own. That's a really important point. And number three, imaging evidence. So characteristic signs of pancreatic inflammation on a contrast-enhanced CT scan. You need two of those three. Got it. Two out of three. Now, super practical question for the ER folks. Before the labs are back, before the CT is done, what are the absolute first things you do? Like non-negotiable first steps. Right. The moment they arrive, assess their volume status. These patients are almost always significantly volume down. They lose a ton of fluid into the retroperitoneum, what we call third spacing. Think of like an internal burn. So priority one is pain control. Absolutely. But right alongside that, you need to start IV fluids immediately, aggressively. This early fluid resuscitation is just critical. We'll talk more about why later, but it can prevent things from getting much worse. Okay, fluids and pain control step. Now, to really understand what's going on, especially with imaging and complications, we need that anatomy foundation. Let's talk key relationships around the pancreas. Yeah, you really do need a good mental map. So the head of the pancreas, and especially the little hook called the uncinated process, it sits right in the C loop of the duodenum. And that matters because... Yeah. Because if the head swells up, it can easily block the duodenum, causing vomiting. Or it can squeeze the common bile duct passing through it, leading to jaundice. Then the neck lies just in front of the superior mesenteric vein, another key relationship. The body crosses the spine, and the tail points towards the spleen. Knowing where these parts are relative to other structures is vital. And function-wise, the ducts and drainage. Dr. Raju often emphasizes the exocrine part here. He does, because it's central to the problem. You've got the exocrine part, the acinar cells making digestive enzymes. These drain into little ductules, then the main pancreatic duct. And that main duct usually joins the common bile duct right at the major ampulla before emptying into the duodenum. That shared exit is exactly why a gallstone stuck there blocks both pathways. The endocrine part, the islets making hormones like insulin, they secrete directly into the blood. Less directly involved in the acute inflammation itself, but obviously important overall. Okay, and the blood vessels. Thinking about ischemia or clots in severe cases, what's the key vascular anatomy to keep in mind? 
It's complex, but crucial. Venous drainage. The superior mesenteric vein drains a small bowel and right colon. It meets the splenic vein coming from the spleen. Where they join, right behind the pancreatic neck, that's the portal vein confluence. It forms the portal vein going to the liver. That confluence is a really important landmark and a potential site for clots and bad pancreatitis. And arteries. Arteries. Yeah. The aorta gives off the celiac artery up high and the superior mesenteric artery, SMA, behind the pancreas. Knowing how close these major vessels are helps you understand risks like pseudoaneurysms or ischemic changes if the inflammation is severe. So putting it all together, how does knowing this detailed anatomy help you when you're actually managing a patient or looking at their scan? Oh, it's fundamental. Helps you predict problems. Swollen head, worry about the duodenum and bile duct. Inflammation near the splenic vein. Watch for thrombosis. And when you look at that CT or MRI, having this 3D map in your head lets you immediately see if the inflammation is messing with nearby ducts, vessels, or organs. <laughs> it directly guides your next steps. Right. Let's talk about those scans. Dr. Raju emphasizes CT with IV contrast using a pancreas protocol. For trainees staring at these images, maybe late at night, what's a solid, systematic way to read them? Okay, two basic rules for any cross-sectional imaging like CT. First, orientation. You're looking up from the patient's feet. So their right side liver is on your left side of the screen. Always orient yourself first. Feet up, view. Got it. Second, tree structures. Don't just look at one slice, scroll up and down, follow that vessel, follow that duct, confirm what it is and see where it's going. Okay, principles down. Now, walk us through the key landmarks. How do you find the pancreas and check its neighborhood systematically? Start easy. Find the spine in the back, right in front of it, the big round aorta, just to the right of the aorta, the flatter, more oval-shaped IVC, inferior vena cava. Now, coming forward off the aorta, find the SMA superior mesenteric artery. Running across, usually sort of draped over the vessels, is the splenic vein. Where the splenic vein meets the vein running with the SMA, that's the SMV, that's your portal confluence. It often looks a bit bulbous. And the pancreas sits right there. Exactly. The pancreas usually sits right in front of the splenic vein and SMA. You look for its typical lobulated texture. Identify the tail over by the spleen, the body crossing the midline, the neck over the confluence, and the head nestled in the duodenum sea loop. Okay, so find the big vessels, find the confluence, find the pancreas. What else? Ducks, other organs? Yep. Medial to the head, look for the little round dot that's the common bile duct. Identify the duodenum wrapping around the head, then glance around. Liver on the left, your left. Gallbladder tucked under it. Spleen on the right, your right. Stomach anterior, kidneys further back. That system makes sense. What about specific spaces where fluid might collect in pancreatitis? Key point. The pancreas is retroperitoneal. The anterior perianal space, which is right in front of the kidney but behind the back lining of the abdominal cabbage, is crucial. Fluid loves to track along here, and from there it can drain downwards into the pericolic gutters alongside the colon. Seeing fluid in these specific retroperitoneal spaces is a hallmark of pancreatitis-related collections. Any other hidden gems on a CT? Dr. Raju mentioned something else you can quickly assess. Yes. Don't just look at the pancreas. Scroll down to the pelvis and look at the iliopsoas muscles. Are they nice and bulky, or are they thin and atrophied? Why check the psoas muscles? It gives you a quick read on sarcopenia, or muscle wasting, which indicates poor nutritional status or protein energy deficiency. That tells you a lot about the patient's overall resilience and prognosis, especially if they have severe pancreatitis. It's valuable information hiding in plain sight. That's a great clinical pearl. Okay, so we can diagnose it, we understand the anatomy, we can read the CT. The next huge step is figuring out why it happened, the etiology. Why is nailing down the cause so critical? It's absolutely paramount because if you don't find and treat the underlying cause, the pancreatitis will likely come back and often it's worse the next time around. And the good news is the most common causes are often treatable. Which are? Gallstones and alcohol. Together they account for, well, probably more than two-thirds of cases. So those are your prime suspects right out of the gate. Let's take gallstones first. Most common cause, right? Especially in women. Tell us about that. Right. Gallstone pancreatitis is number one. Typically, it's not one big stone, but multiple small stones that slip out of the gallbladder, go down the bile duct, and get lodged right at the exit, the ampulla of vader, blocking the pancreatic duct outflow. The classic textbook patient, though not always true, is the 5Fs, female, 40-ish, yeah. fertile, multiple kids, fatty, obese. Clinically, besides the high amylase you might see elevated liver enzymes, AST and ALT, if the bile duct is blocked too. And the definitive test. 
Gallbladder ultrasound. You're looking for stones, those little bright things in the gallbladder that cast an acoustic shadow behind them. That shadow is key to differentiating them from polyps. Okay. And what if the ultrasound is negative, but you still really suspect gallstones? Great question, and a crucial point from Dr. Raju. If the clinical picture fits gallstone pancreatitis, but the first ultrasound is clean, repeat the ultrasound in about a week. Sometimes tiny stones or sludge are missed initially. And if you do find gallstones causing mild pancreatitis? The standard of care is clear. Get the gallbladder out, call a cystectomy, during that same hospital admission before they go home. This prevents recurrent attacks, which can be much more severe. Don't delay the cholecystectomy if it's safe to do so. Okay, crucial management point there for gallstones. Now, what about alcohol? It gets blamed a lot. How much drinking actually causes alcoholic pancreatitis? This is where mistakes are often made. It's frequently overdiagnosed. Alcoholic pancreatitis is not from casual or social drinking. The criteria require heavy alcohol use. And heavy means consuming at least 50 grams of alcohol per day, usually for five years or more. 50 grams a day, how much is that in terms of drinks? Okay, so roughly one standard drink, like a 12-ounce beer, a 5-ounce glass of wine, or 1.5-ounce shot of liquor, has about 14 grams of alcohol. So 50 grams a day is roughly four or more standard drinks every single day for years. Wow, so it's really significant, chronic, heavy drinking. Exactly. So please, don't just label someone with alcoholic pancreatitis because they admit to having a few drinks on the weekend. If you wrongly attribute it to alcohol, you might stop looking and miss the real treatable cause, like small gallstones or maybe high triglycerides or a medication. Always get a clear history on the quantity and duration of alcohol use. So gallstones and alcohol are the big two. Keep digging if those don't fit. Now back to the CT scan. Beyond just diagnosing, it helps us gauge severity. How do you use the CT to classify the injury and any fluid collections? Right, the CT is key for staging. When you look at that scan, you should ask yourself three main questions. One, how far has the inflammation spread, just the pancreas stent, or out into the surrounding fat and tissues, peripancreatic? Yeah. Two, what's the nature of the injury? Is it just swelling and inflammation edema? Or are parts of the pancreas or surrounding tissue actually dead necrosis, which shows up as areas that don't enhance with contrast? And three, are there fluid collections? If yes, is it just simple fluid, liquid, or does it look complex with thicker stuff mixed in, solid debris, meaning necrosis? Okay, extent, nature, edema versus necrosis, and fluid type, how does that differentiate the main types of pancreatitis? It lets you distinguish acute interstitial edematous pancreatitis from the more severe necrotizing pancreatitis, and that difference is huge for prognosis and management. Tell us about interstitial first. Okay, interstitial pancreatitis is basically just inflammation and swelling. On CT, the pancreas looks enlarged, maybe a bit hazy, the lobules might look disrupted. You might see some inflammation or simple fluid around it. If fluid collects, it's called an acute peripancreatic fluid collection. It looks simple, homogenous, just fluid. Usually these resolve on their own. If one persists for more than four weeks, it might develop a wall and become a pseudocyst, a walled off collection of only fluid, no solid stuff inside. In necrotizing. Necrotizing pancreatitis is much more serious. Here, you see actual tissue death necrosis. On the contrast CT, these are areas that don't light up, they stay dark, indicating no blood flow. This can involve the pancreas itself, the surrounding tissue, or both. If fluid develops here, it's called an acute necrotic collection, and it looks different, heterogeneous, complex, a mix of liquid and solid necrotic debris. If these collections persist beyond four weeks and develop a wall, they're called walled-off necrosis, or WUOM. These contain both liquid and solid necrotic material. And you mentioned infection. Right. A critical complication is when a WUOFN gets infected. You suspect infected WUOFN if you see gas bubbles within the collection on the CT scan. Mm -hmm. That often requires drainage. So interstitial versus necrotizing is a fundamental split based on that CT. All right, that classification is clear and obviously impacts care. Let's pivot to medical management. Pain control is a given. What are the other absolute pillars of treatment, especially early on? Beyond pain management, the two absolute cornerstones, mm -hmm. again, really stressed by Dr. Raju, are one, aggressive fluid resuscitation, and two, prompt nutritional support. Fluids. Sounds simple, but you mentioned it's critical. Why so aggressive? What fluids and how much? Are there any risks? Okay, so the why aggressive is that third spacing. They lose massive amounts of fluid into the retroperitoneum, get severely volume depleted, and their organs aren't getting perfused well. Aggressive fluids in the first 24 hours seem crucial to prevent progression from interstitial to necrotizing pancreatitis.
It helps maintain microcirculation in the pancreas. Fluid choice. Ringer's lactate RL is generally preferred over normal saline. There's evidence it might reduce inflammation, and it avoids the hyperchloramic acidosis you can get with tons of saline. And the dosing. Based on studies like the waterfall trial, a common approach is a 10 millikilogamma colis right up front, then an infusion of 1.5 millikilogal hour of RL. Wow, that sounds like a lot of fluid. How do you monitor? You have to monitor very closely. Check heart rate, blood pressure, urine output, frequently, like every hour initially, then maybe every four, six hours. Mm -hmm. Also track BUN and hematocrit every six hours or so. You're looking for vitals to normalize, urine output 0.5 miller kilokirar, BUN to improve, and hematocrit ideally below 45. But you absolutely have to watch for fluid overload. Listen to the lungs for crackles, check oxygen saturation, respiratory rate. In patients with heart failure or kidney disease, you have to be much more cautious with this aggressive approach. It's a balance. Okay, aggressive RL, but monitor closely, especially in certain patients. Now, nutrition. Big point of confusion, do you wait until the pain's gone? Until enzymes are normal? No, absolutely not. That's a really outdated idea and potentially harmful. Do not delay nutrition unnecessarily. You should aim to start feeding within, say, 48 to 72 hours, even in severe necrotizing pancreatitis. And definitely do not wait for pain to completely resolve or for amylosolipase to normalize. Those are not triggers to wait for. So how do you feed them? Enteral nutrition feeding the gut is strongly preferred over 5e -E nutrition. Parenteral. Why? It maintains gut barrier integrity, reduces bacterial translocation from the gut into the bloodstream, improves blood flow to the gut, and has been shown to reduce infection rates, organ failure, and even mortality compared to 5e -E feeding. So if they can eat... If they have interstitial pancreatitis, aren't vomiting, and don't have an ileus, a paralyzed gut, you can often start them on an oral, low-fat, solid diet pretty early, maybe day two or three. No need for that slow progression from clear liquids anymore. And if they can't eat, like in severe necrotizing pancreatitis. If oral isn't tolerated, the next step is tube feeding. Usually nasogastric and G-tube feeding is sufficient. You don't necessarily need to snake the tube down into the jejunum. NG feeding is generally as effective and easier to place. What kind of formula? Typically, a small peptide-based formula with medium chain triglycerides is often recommended as it might be easier to digest and absorb when the pancreas isn't working well. You only resort to parenteral nutrition, IV feeding, if enteral feeding is truly impossible or not tolerated despite trying. Feed the gut if you can. Okay, so early fluids with RL, early enteral nutrition, don't wait for pain or enzymes to normalize. That's a clear shift from older practices. So wrapping this up, what's the big picture for our listeners managing these patients? I think this deep dive shows that really mastering acute pancreatitis requires pulling everything together. You need the clinical suspicion, the diagnostic criteria, that solid anatomical map in your head, the ability to read the CT for severity and complications. Pinpointing the cause, like gallstones or ruling out heavy alcohol use. Exactly. And then implementing those key management principles, aggressive early fluids with Ringer's lactate, and prompt enteral nutrition whenever possible. Getting those first 24, 48 hours right, especially the fluids, can make a huge difference in preventing severe complications. So it's about having a systematic approach, grounded in evidence like Dr. Raju presents, that you can apply reliably every time you see these patients. It's moving from just knowing the facts to being truly effective. Right. And that leads to a final thought for you to consider in your own practice. We know how critical that early aggressive hydration is. So what kind of systems, maybe protocols or checklists, could your ER or your inpatient service put in place to make absolutely sure that every single patient with suspected pancreatitis gets that prompt fluid resuscitation initiated without fail, even when things are incredibly busy? Something definitely worth thinking about. Until next time, keep diving deep.